Open in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 19. And as we turn there, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce to you again the wonderful facets of the Word of God and the self-description. But I want to introduce the facet we're looking at this morning, and that is the fact that the Word of God is presented by God in this self-portrait that God wrote of his word as being the divine witness. I was studying this week about the mysteries that fill our world. Now, some of you have maybe not thought about this for a long time, but there are many events, there are many structures in our world that we don't understand just where they came from and how they were made. One example, there are over 50,000 megaliths you know what a megalith is? Lithos is the word for stone, and mega is great, great stones. These are circles of stones, the smallest, which are 20 tons. Massive, you, you've heard of Stonehenge. That's a megalith. There are 50,000 megalith circles on the western coast of Europe, and these and inland from there. And these stones, we, we don't quite understand who put them up, how they put them up how they erected these massive stones and brought them sometimes 50 and 60 miles from quarries that, that had been found inland and brought them and made these perfect concentric megalithic circles. We know that they were to do with the worship of the stars and astrological and most likely pagan and most likely occultic, but we don't know very much about them. How about the faces on Easter Island uh, way out there? West of, of South America, Easter Island has these stone faces that are facing out westward, and some of them weigh 65 tons. They were brought from far away parts of the island, and they are standing up facing the west. What type of people could carve and erect and move 65 ton rocks on a very, very precipitous side of a cliff and have them facing? Amazing the mysteries of our world. I think about the pyramids, one of my favorite spots. 2.3 million blocks weighing 6.5 million tons. That means every one of those blocks, all 2.3 million of them that were hauled up and placed there, weighed over 3 tons each. The pyramids are 481 feet high, and they are perfectly on an exact angle following down those stone blocks. Now, how did they do that? How did they get those things up there? Those are mysteries. Now, I've heard a lot of speculation. If you look on the World Wide Web, you can find out uh, from spacemen to, to uh, prehistory civilization. But, but we don't know. And how did Herod, in more recent times, move the temple stones? Now, Herod's temple, the, the temple in Jerusalem, is, is massive. But underneath it is something bigger than the temple mount. And that are the huge foundational stones. Some of them are 30 feet long, 10 feet wide, and weigh 120 tons. And when you go on tour, and, and while the tour guides are leading, I usually do this, I go over and I try and stick something between them. And you can't get more than a pen knife between those 120 ton blocks. They're sitting so close to each other. Now, before hydraulics, before modern engineering, how did a what we would consider less than civilized culture that we have, how did they move blocks like that? Who built Machu Picchu up in the top of the Andes Mountains? I mean, the lost city of the Incas. Who built that, and how did they get it up there so many thousands of feet high? And how did they have such an intricate civilization that escapes our understanding? There are so many mysteries, even common mysteries in our time, like how did our recent three, four months ago, TWA flight blew up. All those would be solved if someone was there and was a, someone you could trust, someone that knew what was going on, that was a witness to those events. Well, look at Psalm 19, because more than who built Machu Picchu or how the pyramids were built, God has witnessed the greatest events, the greatest mysteries of the universe, and we're going to look at those this morning. The mystery of creation, the mystery of life and death and marriage and family, uh, how the world's going to end, heaven. I mean, those are, the, those are better than the pyramids. I mean, the pyramids are crumbling. But God says, if you follow me, you, you'll never crumble. You will never die if you know the mysteries that I want to tell you. Psalm 19 and, and verse 7. Because this psalm gives us the ultimate light on the scriptures. This is the greatest insight into what God thinks about this book you're holding. 
And, and maybe if you've never done this before, I'm going to go slowly enough this morning that you can see, uh, and a lot, my children, I travel enough with them, they always want to know where we're going. And so I'm going to show you the six successive steps. We're on step two. There are four ahead of us, so you know exactly. I mean, you can even read ahead and know what we're going to cover. There are six synonyms for the Word of God in these three verses, seven, eight, and nine. There are 12 qualities that are attached to these synonyms. Altogether, there are 18 descriptions of the Word of God in this inspired divine photograph of the power that God has put into his word. First of all, the titles, uh, those titles are all synonymous. And the first one is in verse 7 we saw last week. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. We saw last week, this is his perfect law that restores the word of God as the divine teacher. So God says, when you look at my book, When you look at my Bible, what I want you to think about is, I want you to think about coming into a classroom. And he says, this book is the divine teacher. The only thing is that those who know Christ get to have the author of the book be their teacher. That's a neat thing. When I went to school and had the textbook in class written by the professor that taught the class, that was kind of neat. It was exciting to be able to ask him, now why did you write that on this page? Or... How did you find that? Or where did you do this research? Or what was the background? And you could actually interact with the author of the text that we were using. Well, every morning or at noon or at night, whenever you find your private time with the Lord, you get to interact with the author. And he is for us the divine teacher. It's the total transformational truth of God in this book that he teaches to us. And when we receive his teaching, it changes us. This morning, the second part of verse 7, it says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Here we find that his sure testimony can make us wise. And here we find that God shows himself to be the divine witness, the witness to events no one else has ever witnessed. I mean, we're going to look this morning at, God says, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Uh, our earth is 7,950 miles or so, give or take a little bit, in diameter. The core of our planet, uh, the longer we study it, the less we know about it. But the current theory is that the core is densely packed nickel and iron that is so compressed by the weight of the surface pushing downward that the core of our earth is hotter than the surface of the sun. That's, that's the most recent scientific understanding of our earth. God says, hey, were you there when I laid that thing? Were you there when I set up all of the forces that cause and govern the surface? The surface of the earth is much like the shell on an egg. It's so minute compared to the rest of the foundations God has laid. God says, I'm the witness. He says, I can tell you in an absolutely trustworthy way what happened. At the beginning of time, at the beginning of the creation of the universe, I will tell you about how man was formed and and what I built into mankind. And, And I started marriage, if you want to know about that. And God says, and I started the family, if you want to know about that. And I started civilization, and I started human government. And he says, go right down the line. Do you want a witness of what the original intent of all those things were? He says, I'll give it to you. God's the divine witness. And God's testimony is absolutely trustworthy, as opposed to what you might hear in a televised trial. God never lies. Thirdly, in in verse 8, we find his right statues that rejoice our hearts. It's the word of God giving us the divine direction. Statutes is a synonym for directions. Have you ever tried to find your way and you roll the window down and stop and and ask someone, uh, uh, do you know where such and such is? Now, I learned a lesson. You never ask that, you know, in New York City because they will purposely try and get you lost. You know, they'll say, oh, yeah, and if you want to go over here, you know, to Long Island, they'll send you back, you know, to Philadelphia uh, on purpose. I think they glee in that. But, but this, if you ask God directions, uh, his statutes or, or his precepts rejoice our heart because they're always right. He always takes us to the place that, that we're looking for. And he always tells us, it says here, the precepts or the statutes or the divine directions of the Lord, they're right, and they bring rejoicing to the heart. And if you find your heart all shriveled up and not full of joy, it's because you're either not asking or not following the directions that God gives. Fourthly, in the second part of verse 8, it says this, 
the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And here we, we come into contact with God's pure commandments that enlighten. And here the word of God is shown to be the divine decrees. God's decrees. God has set these decrees in motion. Uh, as an example, on the physical realm, gravity. I mean, you can say, I don't believe in gravity. I don't think there are laws out there. Or I'm not under laws. And then you just go to the edge of the cliff and jump off and see if the laws are operating. God says, I have put eternal decrees out. And your eternity is based on whether or not you will conform your life to my decrees, whether you will submit to them. And what, what happens if we do? Well, his divine decrees, his commandments, they're pure. They enlighten our eyes. They give us a a clear portrait of God's non-negotiables. I mean, if you can come into a situation and know what is non-negotiable, then you don't even waste your time on that. You just say, okay, that's a given in the deal. And what can we negotiate? God says, my word gives you the non-negotiables. I give you what you can't change and what you must conform to. And he says, and if you will conform to those, the end of verse 8, your eyes will be enlightened. I recently visited someone that they have a little dog that's blind. And it reminds me so much of what people are like. This little dog, it's so sweet. He's looking for his master, and, and, and he can't see. And so, bump, his head would hit the, the, the leg of the chair. So it would turn, bump, it would hit the edge of the wall. And, but it kept looking for that voice or, or kept trying to find its master's voice and then finally jumped up in the chair. Well, you know, a lot of people go through life like that. They're, they're blind. They've never had their spiritual eyes opened, or maybe they have, but they're not looking into the law of God, and they're just bumping into stuff, and they go, oh, what was that? Oh, what was that? And they're bumping into the decrees of God. God says, you may not do this, you may not do that. If you do this, if you sow the flesh, or from the flesh reap corruption, and if you, and he just goes right through, and they just keep, Bumping, and they think that's what life is supposed to be like, running around blind, bumping into stuff. I'll tell you, it's abnormal. God intended for us to have, look at the end of verse 8, enlightened eyes. He says, I want you to see from eternal perspectives, from my perspective, the world as it ought to be. Chapter uh, 19, verse 9, the first part, is the fifth one. And it says in, in 9a, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. We are going to meet, this morning I'm just going to mention, this is God's clear, clean fear that endures. This is the word of God giving us the divine conditions. The divine condition that we are to live in is fearing God and acknowledging by our actions that God sees us. Now, here's a little insight into David. David sinned. He committed adultery. And then he covered his tracks quite well. I mean, he pulled in the, the adulteress and married her so that it would appear to be his child uh, in the confines of marriage. And then he has her husband killed. And, and he, you know, he just had everything all worked out. And when Samuel the prophet came to him, he said, he says, you know what you've done? He says, you have reproached God. He says, let alone murder and, and adultery and lying and breaking all the commandments. He says, you have brought a reproach against God. Do you know what the fear of the Lord is? And we're going to examine this at length in a couple of weeks. The fear of the Lord is being more concerned, not that I'm going to get found out that will ruin my reputation, or not that if I ever do that, it will ruin my marriage or my family or my children or my coworkers or my neighbors or my parents. The ultimate condition to live the Christian life in it is saying, not if someone finds out, it's I will not do that, period, in the sight of God who watches me all the time. I don't want to bring a reproach against God. I don't want to consider him to not be watching. See, that's how a lot of people live their lives, as if God wasn't watching, as if God was the blind animal that can't see. They forget the fact that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, that God sees all, that he knows all. And the ultimate condition the scriptures teach that brings cleanness to our lives is fearing God so much because he sees us. Do you remember what happened uh, about 4,000 years ago in a little palace in Egypt? A young man was accosted by a married woman and that young 20-year-old man, all alone, with no one watching, no uh, security cameras, you know, no wiretaps, nobody with blackmail photographs, all alone in a room, this woman accosts him, 
proposes immoral things. And you know what he says inside that room? No, how can I do this evil and sin against God? And Potiphar's wife looks at him and says, against who? He says, God, he's in the room with me. He watches everything I do. That's the divine condition we're all supposed to live in. When you go into the business meeting, when you go into the business trip, when you go into the schoolroom, when you're all alone, when you're on the far side of the planet serving in the military, when you're all alone at night in front of your computer, when you're reading something, whether you bought it yourself or got it, no matter where you are in life, when you're doing your taxes, when you're uh, in any type of social setting, the person that's always present is God. And the divine condition is to acknowledge he's there to check in with him and say, I know you're watching. I do. And I'm going to live like it. That's the divine condition. That's, that's the way God wants us to live. And the last one, in, in verse 9 at the end, it says, The judgments of the Lord are true. They're righteous altogether. This is God's true judgments. They vindicate us. They're his divine decisions. They're his judgments that give us his final word on everything. I mean, we already know how it's all going to turn out. We already know who the winners are. We already know who the losers are going to be. And God says, if you already know that, build your life on it. Build your life on my judgments. You already know how it's going to turn out. Well, this morning, let's dissect the second part of verse 7. And I want to show you some key things, and then we're going to take a trip around the Scriptures. But it says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. But here's where we're going to stop, Letter or the second half of verse 7. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. Let's stop on that word sure for just a minute. I want to give you a little insight into that. It's a very, very interesting word. The Hebrew word for sure, nemana is the word. It means firmness, certainty, a pillar of support. It's a passive uh, form of this verb. So what it conveys is not just firmness, but confirmedness. It's not that the law of the Lord is actively sure. What it is is it it is sure in itself. It is a confirmedness. It is a pillar of its own self. Uh, what's interesting, this word is used in Genesis 42.20. I'll read it to you. Uh, this is an interchange with uh, Joseph when he's in Egypt and Jacob and Canaan and the brothers running back and forth. But bring your youngest brother, uh, Joseph, when they didn't know who he was, said to his older brothers, unto me, so shall your words be verified and you not die verified i will if you bring me your younger brother joseph said then it'll confirm your words it will make them sure it will make them certain what is god's word saying when it says that the law of the lord is sure it's saying this book is worthy of being absolutely followed i mean god has confirmed it to us he said absolutely follow it stake your life on me something happens when we find a firm object to hold on to in life Have you ever noticed a transformation that comes in people when they uh, finally know why they're here and know what they're doing and just to doing it? It's it's transformational. We call it growing up. Some people haven't ever grown up, and and some of us are in the process of growing up. But it's really neat to see people when they know where they're headed. Well, Frank Morrison, a lawyer, once wrote a book which describes a group of people that finally saw the Word of God as sure. And and I want to read to you just a couple lines from his book. It's called Who Moved the Stone? And he's talking about the disciples and the early followers of Christ. In the time just before and then leading up to and following the resurrection, that last few hours of before the resurrection and after, this is what Frank Morrison says. The material from which we have to derive the dynamic force of the apostles consists of a habitual doubter like Thomas, a rather weak fisherman like Peter, a gentle dreamer like John, and a practical tax gatherer like Matthew. And then there were a few seafaring men like Andrew and Nathaniel and those inevitable women, and at most two or three others. But there they sit, shivering with fear, seething with doubt, and overcome by despair. Listen to John 20 and verse 19. And the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, this is Resurrection Day, When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. They had come together on the first day of the week, on Sunday, on on Resurrection Day, that Jesus had, had set aside as a day to remember, like we do here. And yet, in spite of everything he had told them and everything that had been affirmed to them by the women and, and Peter and John seeing the empty tomb, they still were fearful, and they were shivering, and they were seething. They didn't know what to do. 
That's how they were before the word of God was sure. But then, just a few weeks later, listen to Acts 2.14, because this is a testimony of the same group of people after the Lord made his word clear to them. But Peter, Acts 2.14, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to all that were listening, You men of Judea, all that dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known unto you and hearken to my words. The fellow that was shivering with fear and cussing and saying, I don't know Christ, a few weeks later stands in front of everyone and says, You can do whatever to me you want to do. Listen to me, though. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. What was the change? Well, Listen again to what Frank Morrison says. The peculiar thing about this phenomenon is not only did it spread to every single member of the party of Jesus with whom we have any trace, but they actually brought it to Jerusalem. And they carried it with inconceivable audacity to the most keenly intellectual center of Judea and against the ablest dialecticians of the day. And in the face of every impediment a brilliant and highly organized group could devise, they won. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about the fact that, that these peasants and fishermen and, and, and these, these itinerant people came back. They didn't start Christianity up where no one knew anything and where they could, you know, pull the wool over their eyes. They went to the center of intellectual, cultural, and religious life of the day. And they stood in front of the leaders of it, and they said, we are sure Christ rose from the dead. What happened? Well, within 20 years, the claims of these Galilean peasants disrupted the Jewish church and impressed itself upon every town on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean from Caesarea to Troas, and in less than 50 years it began to threaten the peace of the entire Roman Empire. When we have said everything, Morrison says, that can be said about the willingness of certain types of people to believe what they want to believe, to be carried away with their emotions, to assert a fact which originally reached them as hearsay, and to stand confronted with the greatest mystery of all, we ask ourselves, why did those people win? Why did the apostles win? Here's the answer. We know. They had come face to face with the divine witness. A sure testimony. They saw the risen Christ. And from John 19, 19's gloom, when they're seething in doubt, to Acts 2's boldness and confrontation at all costs, the only change was that they witnessed what you witness every time you open this book. They witnessed God's sure word. Do you this morning hold that witness in your hands and by faith live it in your heart? Do you find God's word sure? Do you find this morning that you can know things that you would know no other way except by believing the sure witness of God? Back to Psalm 19. It says, who does God make sure? It says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That's a very interesting word. In fact, when I was in Hebrew class, after I learned this word, we we used to call people pethies. That's the Hebrew word, P-E-T-H-I, a pethy. What's a pethy? Well, you've all seen pethies. Uh, I mean, um, Andy Griffith. Who was the little sidekick of Andy Griffith, the sheriff guy? Barney. Barney. There's a TV watcher right there. Barney. Barney is a pethy, his figure he carries out. It's a person like this. If they're with you, you're going, oh, we ought to do this. They go, oh, yes, we ought to do that. And then you see someone else. They say, no, we should do that. Oh, no, we should do that. And they're just like a swinging door. The Hebrew word is someone that swings on a, on a pivot. It's just wherever the wind's blowing, they're going the same way. That's a pethy. Someone that doesn't know. I mean, if, if the crowd's going this way, they're going this way. If the crowd goes this way, they go this way. They're a pethy. Now, listen. A pethy is a person that's naive or literally one who has an open-door mind. He goes with whatever hits him just then and then changes with the next wind. What can the absolutely true testimony of God on any topic do for the inexperienced, open-door-minded person that often some of us become, and all of us at one time or another have been? God can take that open door and with his sure testimony make us wise. Now look back at at verse 7. The testimony, that's the divine witness of the Lord, is sure. That means it's firm, it's supported. Uh, Making wise the pethies. What's the word wise? Shakam. Very interesting word. A Hebrew word. It doesn't mean facts. Christianity is not amassing more facts. 
Because knowledge puffs us up. And the more facts we have, we think we really know it. In Hebrew, wisdom was not facts. But it's being skilled in the art of holy living. It's experienced, lived out truth. Now, look at the verse. It says that God, his sure testimony, will, will give us a witness and confirm in our lives how we can be skilled in the art of holy living. Is there anything more important than that? In the scriptures, God is always the source of this shakam wisdom. Every time the word wisdom, this particular word shakam, which means skilled in the art, it's always used as something God produces. As it says in James chapter 3, the wisdom that's from above, it's from God. It descends on us. It's his shakam. It's his wisdom. And he's the source. Because God, by a sure testimony, can make all who come to him skillful in the art of living divinely. Well, how do we do this? And this is where we're going to conclude this morning. I'm going to take you on a quick journey. How do we translate this book into holy living? Well, we bow before the author. We call him our divine teacher. And we yield to his divine witness. We meet him sitting on the witness stand, telling us what we don't know about a situation, and we bow before him. The word testimony is always and only used of the Lord. It's always speaking of the reality of him as almighty God being the best witness to every event. Now, let me show you a few events. Turn back to Genesis 1. And we'll start in Genesis, and we're going to go forward to Revelation. And I want to show you God being the perfect witness. I have a friend. He's an expert witness. And they call him in, and they pay him $250 an hour. And he speaks as an expert witness on this thing. Can you imagine just wearing a suit and flying somewhere and getting 250 an hour to sit on the witness stand and be an expert witness? I can't, but I'll tell you what, God for free will sit as the expert witness. Number one on creation, the beginning. Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God. And here's the witness stepping forth. Here's the divine witness taking the stand. Here he he comes before us and he says, no theories, no mysteries, I was there. I'll tell you what happened to creation. Listen to me as I speak as an eyewitness. Okay, what does he tell us? Well, from the dawn of the universe. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form. It was void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God hovered or moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And instantly, by divine creative power, light began. You say, wow, wasn't there any light before that? The divine witness says that the light that we know in the universe, he began it all when he spoke. I mean, I don't, I don't have to speculate. Now, is this just in one part of the universe? Was he over here? I mean, he's the only one there. Why would my little warped, twisted, fallen human mind questioned the only person that witnessed that event. I mean, he said it happened. And before time began and before matter existed and before the forces that bind our cosmos together were instituted by the creator, God speaks. And they come into existence. Well, uh, he also said this in the book of Job. And now turn to the middle of your Bible, Job. And this is uh, Job confronting his creator in chapter 38. And he says this in Job 38 in verse 4. Right in the middle, just four Psalms. Where were you, God says to Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you around, Job? Of course, we'd all have to answer no with Job. You know, from the foundation of the earth, I can see God talking about from the dawn of the universe because I like stars and galaxies and all that stuff out there. But, you know, until I really spent time this week looking at the foundation of the earth, I never thought it was a big deal. It doesn't sound like much until you penetrate the thin skin of the earth. And as I said earlier, proportionately, it's the size of the shell of an egg to the egg. And the the shell is the crust, but the core of the earth, the foundations, is the big part of the earth. Beneath the crust of our earth, which is only 30 miles thick in some places, 90 miles thick in others, is what we call the mantle. And it's made up of a rigid lithosphere, lithos stone, a stone sphere. It's kind of uh, got one component that, that's called an asthenosphere, which means it's a, a semi-solid kind of elastic plastic. That's where our earthquakes ripple through there. Below that is a solid mesosphere. And then the foundations are the core and the outer core. The outer core is liquid nickel and iron, liquid metal, 
densely compressed, superheated. The inner core is solid because it's so compressed, and it's 6,000 degrees centigrade. That's hotter than the surface of the sun temperature. You know, when they were mapping and doing their studies on the Earth, oceanographers in the 60s were, were trying to figure out what they could figure out about the core of the Earth from the surface, and they started mapping the oceans. And it took them about 18 years to map the floor of the oceans. That's when they found all the canyons and the trenches and all that. But you know what they found is, is interesting? There is a 46,000-mile mountain range that completely encircles our planet and goes through all seven of the seas. It's an unbroken mountain range that just runs through the waters of this planet, of which a majority of this planet of the surface is water. And what God said is, he says, Do you know about when I laid the foundations of the earth, when I caused the mountains to rise up? I mean, they didn't even know until the 60s about this mountain range. It, it crops up in places, the Hawaiian Islands, the Azores, and other places. But God says, do you know how I did all that? Do you know how I put in the, the, the forces that, that put this planet together, that caused the heat to radiate out, that caused all the seismic activity? Look at Isaiah for another one. Uh, Isaiah, it goes Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Isaiah, chapter 40. Now I'm going to start reading in verse 12. Because God says, from the dawn of the universe, I'm the only witness. I was the only one that was down at the foundations of the earth. When I put it together, when I raised the mountains up from the deep, he says, I'm the only one that was there. He says, I'm also the only one that can speak to you from the throne of the Almighty Creator, which is beyond all that we can comprehend. And here he's speaking in Isaiah 40. And this is a great chapter. If you're ever a little discouraged about what's going on in your world, and if it's cracking and falling in, and if, if there are earthquakes in your world, sometime turn to Isaiah 40. We all know verse 31, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and will mount up with wings like eagles. And we like to comfort ourselves with that verse, but it's not as comforting as it could be unless you start in verse 12. Let me show you verse 12. Who measured the waters in the hollow of his hands? Who marked off the heavens by a span? Now, the universe, our whole universe, God, what he's saying here graphically is he says, I just go like that. And he says, I measure the universe. That means that God is so much greater than our universe. And the entire cosmos as we know it, this seemingly infinite, expanding universe, God goes, hmm, it's about that long. Kind of like you check your squash in the garden, see how they're growing. Oh, it's growing a little bit. God, see, he says, I'm sitting on my throne. He says, I'm I'm." bigger, I'm beyond, I'm more than all of your world and all the storms within it. He says, who's calculated, continuing verse 12, the dust of the earth by measure and weighed the mountains in a balance, the hills on a pair of scales? And we didn't even know about that 46,000 mile long mountain range. God says, I've already weighed them. I put them there. I know all about them. Who's directed, verse 13, the Spirit of the Lord. Verse 15, behold, the nations, they're a drop in the bucket. You, you ever heard that expression? Oh, it's just a drop in the bucket. Who thought of that expression? God. He says all the people, all the civilizations, all the armaments, all the terrorists, and all the armies, he said, are just a drop in the bucket. He said they're nothing. They're regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Verse 18, to whom will you liken God? What likeness will you compare with him? Verse 19, are you going to be involved in the folly of idolatry? Are you going to try and reduce the infinite God to an image? Verse 21, don't you know? Have you not heard? Has not it been declared to you from the beginning? Haven't you understood from the foundations of the earth? We just talked about that. The asthenosphere and the mesosphere and the inner core and the, the, the outer core. Hasn't it been declared to you from the beginning? Verse 22, that he who sits above the circle of the earth. Isaiah was written 600 B.C., and Isaiah knew more than scientists knew until the 16th century A.D. Isaiah knew that the earth was a circle, a sphere. And it says right here, God says, he doesn't say like the Persian mystery gods and like a lot of the other gobbledygook of false religions that the earth is flat and all this stuff. He says, I sit on my throne above the vault, the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth, verse 22 says, are like grasshoppers. God says, I am the one who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. 
I spread them out like a tent to dwell in. The whole universe to God is like spreading out a tent. I mean, it's just, it's really kind of easy for him. He's beyond all that. Verse 25, to whom will you liken me, that I should be as equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high. See who has created the stars. He didn't just create them. The one who leads forth their host by number. He doesn't just number them. He calls them all by name. Next time you think you have too many problems, next time you think that there is just too much going on in your world, that it's just too heavy, that nobody knows, that you have tried and you're about ready to give up, think about the one who wants to be the divine witness to you to how to live your life and how to live my life that says, I made the stars, I've numbered them all, and they're not, I'm not impersonally related to them. Uh, You know how often you call and they say, the first thing you say, you're going to try and order something on the phone. Could you look at the label on the front of your magazine and give us your number, please? They don't care your name. Could you give us your number, please? You know, we're just so impersonalized in our society. And you know what God says? I created the stars, I numbered them, but I'm not impersonal. I gave them all a name. And God says, if I named those solar furnaces, and if I've numbered the hairs on your head, how much more concern do you think I have for you? Continuing to read, because, verse 26, because of the greatness of his power and the strength of his might, not one star is missing. He doesn't. He doesn't, you know, when God's in charge of things, a lot better than when we are. I was just sharing in Bible story time with our children that when God ran the Israeli army, they didn't have any casualties. They wiped out all the twelve nation, or the seven nations of the Canaanites. They wiped out every one of them. They didn't lose a single soldier. They had not only no deaths, they had no injuries. When God runs the army, the first time they ran it, they got wiped out. And they ran home, scared to death little lesson here. God says, I'm the divine witness. I'll tell you how to live life. I'll tell you how to know the end from the beginning. I will tell you how to, to find out, and we'll see next time, how to live your life in marriage, how to raise your family. God says, great, you got Spock to tell you what the little spots are on your children's neck. How would you like to know about the spots on their soul? I'll tell you how to deal with those because I'm the one that created the family. I'm the one that gives you the authority to be a godly parent. You want to know how to have a marriage that God says is supposed to be like intoxicatingly wonderful? You don't have to go to a weekend retreat with Dennis Rainey, although it's okay to do that. God says, I will give you a daily instruction in marriage. What happens if we don't listen? And I want to close with this. This was painted on the wall of a cathedral in medieval Europe in Lübeck, Germany. And you've probably heard it before, but you didn't know where it came from. And some monk studying the scriptures, probably in the same generation as Martin Luther from the age of the cathedral, finally came to grips with the scriptures as the divine witness of God. And I believe it changed his life. And he painted this on the cathedral wall. You call me master and obey me not. You call me light and yet you see me not. You call me the way, but you walk me not. You call me the life, but you live me not. You call me wise, you follow me not. You call me fair, and yet you live me not. You call me rich, you ask me not. You call me eternal, you seek me not. If I condemn thee, blame me not. What happens when you don't listen to the divine witness? Then the scriptures say in Revelation 20, verse 15, that all who will not listen to that witness and who will not in faith bow to the simple message of salvation, who will not humble themselves, contritely confess that they are lost and a sinner and that he alone, Jesus Christ, is the only payment for their sin, for those who will not submit to him as Lord and yield to him as Savior, forgiver, giver of eternal life, it says that they will someday stand all alone before his throne and he will cast them or have them cast by a mighty angel into the lake of fire that burneth with fire and brimstone eternally. If I condemn thee, blame me not. Why? Because he says, I'm the divine witness. I've revealed myself to you. Let's bow before him, the author of this book this morning. And Lord, I thank you that you are the divine witness. 
And as the songwriter said, how firm a foundation ye saints of the Lord is laid for your rest in his excellent word. What more can he say than to us he has said, to us who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Oh, I pray that this morning every single one within the hearing of your word this morning will have fled to Jesus for refuge. And if they have never fled to Jesus today, they will flee less. In the end, they be condemned. Thank you for the divine witness, how excited we are to look at your word that way this week. And I pray we would. I pray we would carve out time from the mundane and from the temporal and from the passing, from the vacuous, from the the urgent, and just focus on the eternal. And let you witness to us life as you want us to live it, death as you have planned it and how we prepare for it, Eternity and how we can start investing and getting ready and send building materials ahead for you to use in our eternal habitations. We ask, O Father, that you would draw to yourself any who have never fled to Jesus for refuge. And for those of us who have, that today we would take time to be holy and spend much time in secret with you. We'll thank you for your great blessings. For Christ's sake we pray, amen.